Wise Studies presents The Early Teachings of the Buddha with Sarah Shaw. At Wise Studies, we are committed to illuminating the texts and teachings of the world's great contemplative traditions. In this series, Sarah looks at several texts in the Pali Canon from the Diga Nikaya, the collection of long discourses. She explores the Buddha's teachings on subjects including meditation, ethics, meditative states, and conditionality. In this first session, Sarah gives an overview of the Course. She offers an historical and cultural background for the early suttas and discusses some of the key teachings in Buddhist philosophy, including the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Welcome to this introduction to the texts of the Diganakaya, the, the long suttas of the Buddha. I chose this selection of texts to introduce Buddhist theory about meditation and practice because they were the first texts that were introduced to me and I found them very helpful in understanding how meditation works and how Buddhist theory works in daily life and on a larger scale, in the, on a cosmological scale. The texts have quite a bit of background, so I'll just start off by explaining something about this. They date from around the 4th century BCE, um, shortly after the, the death of the Buddha. There's rather a nice story about the composition of these and the other texts of the Buddhist canon, the early Buddhist canon. During the Buddha's lifetime, he had an attendant called Ananda, who cared for him constantly and who fielded questions from others and stood in for the Buddha occasionally and was a great a uh, kindly figure within the Buddhist Sangha, the early monks and nuns. He was, however, not enlightened. All the other monks and nuns who were close attendants and followers of the Buddha achieved awakening and were regarded as something called an arahat, an awakened one. Ananda, however, could not seem to be able to do it. He's, he was spending so much time caring for others. He was really the, the monk who was instrumental in ensuring that the Buddha did establish a female sangha of nuns. He was a great defender of the nuns. And he seems to have been somebody who just looked after people and didn't perhaps have so much time for his own personal practice. He's also the one person who burst into tears when the Buddha announced his forthcoming death in the Parinibbana Sutta. The other Harahats, of course, were uh, fully awakened and were unperturbed by this event, but Ananda just started crying. I think this endears him to us because he really represents to me the common man and the person who is not awakened but who is very kindly and has many of the attributes that we need to be just human beings together. After the Buddha's death, the Arahats assembled and decided that they needed to have a council to, dis to discuss the transmission of his teachings. Ananda, however, was not invited because he had not achieved awakening. So he was quite upset about this and worked very, very hard on his meditation in the time before the First Council. Unfortunately, it did not go very well. And the day before the First Council, he finally accepted the fact that possibly complete awakening was just not going to happen to him in this lifetime. So he thought, well, I'll just go to bed. In between the postures of standing up and lying down, Ananda achieved awakening as he got into bed. So the next morning he was able to attend the very first council of the Buddhist elders. 
I like this story, obviously, because it gives us uh, a sense of encouragement and also a sense that sometimes it's when you let go of things that they can actually happen. But it was very important that Arnanda did attend this meeting because he had the most capacious memory of all the Arahats and he could, according to the tradition, remember all the discourses that the Buddha gave in his presence. So every, every sutta, or pretty well every sutta in the Buddhist canon, and the sutta is uh, along a text that's uh, given on a particular occasion, Every sutta is prefaced by the words Ewang me suttang, thus have I heard. I have heard thus. And it will be something which the reciter of the text will be saying. He will have learnt it from the person who recited the text to him. So he will have, it will be a true statement for the reciter, for the person whom, who he heard it from, and from the person he heard it from, going right back to Ananda. The thus I have heard refers, of course, to uh, Ananda. So every Buddhist text, every Buddhist text, most Buddhist texts, are prefaced by this short statement that reminds us of Ananda's great memory and his ability to recollect the sayings of the Buddha. The collection we're looking at, and which I've chosen because it seems so rich and so various and so human, is called the Diga Nikaya. And this means the very long texts. So I'm only going to talk about a few, but I very much hope that this will inspire an interest in the other ones. First of all, I should explain a little bit about the construction of the various texts in the Pali Canon, and then I will explain in a more general sense some of the background to the collection we're looking at in these sessions. After the Buddha's death at a series of councils, the texts were agreed upon and this seems to have been quite a fluid agreement because we know that further texts were added that people remembered or that came up over time. They were passed on by groups of monks called banakas and indeed nuns called banikas who memorised certain sections of the Pali Canon and transmitted it for further generations. Now, in doing this, they were adapting uh, an older Indian model whereby texts such as the Rig Veda or the, the, all of the sacred texts of the Brahmins were passed on through family lines so that one family would act as custodians of a particular set of texts. And then when the male child was old enough to... Uh, learn and recite them, he would be given an initiation and would learn his own family's sacred texts. These would be in Sanskrit. The language was felt to be unchanging and, and a divine language. And the knowledge was regarded as in some sense secret and very specialized, requiring a priest to sustain it. And these were considered very sacred roles in the Brahminic tradition. The Buddha had a very different attitude to, towards texts. He did not advocate the policy of uh, any particular language being regarded as, as sacred. He um, said one should not have the closed fist in teaching, and his teachings were regarded as accessible to everyone. He completely ignored caste in his order of monks. It was of no interest to him. And he allowed women to become nuns, which was pretty revolutionary at the time. So for him, language was actually a medium for communication. After his death, 
the the monks um, and indeed one presumes the nuns who sustained the body of texts obviously couldn't do it through a family line because they were monastics so we have different groups of chanters doing this sangiti this chanting singing together and sustaining the lineage of particular groups of texts the texts were divided into three what are called baskets the tripitaka the vinaya which is the rules for monks um this was really under the custodianship of the arahat hupali and this is he he was a very low caste barber who was ordained before all the princes he was accompanying ordained with the buddha so that he could always take precedence over them because the monastic sangha only gives precedence on the basis of time of ordination and he made the vinaya the the rules for monks his speciality another collection of of the three is the abhidhamma which is uh, really the higher teaching which the buddha is said to have taught to his mother um when he visited her in a heaven realm she had died so she descended from the heaven realm she was in to go to the heaven of the 33 where discussion takes place and the buddha taught to this teaching of the mind and its mental states of a very subtle kind the collection we're looking at though is from the sutta the basket of suttas the sutta pitika this is the collection that refers to specific instances and times and places and in a way it's it, it's the one we can relate to most particularly if we're lay people many of them were apparently delivered to lay people specifically and some to monks um but they involve a lot of uh stories and particular times when teachings were given the buddha's teaching is characterized by certain elements which we do not think were present in early indian teaching before this though we do of course have little information about that subject where his innovation appears to lie is is that he actually looked at people who asked him questions and adapted his teachings to them so that if he's teaching um a woman who works in the house uh visaka he will use images derived from cleaning and cooking uh so that she will be able to appreciate what he's saying if he's talking to a farmer he'll talk he'll use agricultural imagery and if he's talking to a brahmin he will um often very humorously play with brahminical terms and readapt them so the teachings are very adaptive and we need to really come across quite a few sutras to get a sense of this wide-ranging and human appeal amongst the sutras there are four major collections the anguttara nikaya the majjhima nikaya the sangyutta nikaya and the diga nikaya the sangyutta nikaya is the connected discourses the uh, anguttara nikaya is the the graded discourses graduated discourses the majjhima nikaya are the middle length discourses and the selection we're looking at are from the diga nikaya the long discourses there are 34 suttas in this collection now a sutta is a piece of text that many people have related the word to a thread something woven together which is a very happy uh, analogy because they do seem woven together in various ways they are they have a lot of uh, repetitions and what's called redundancy but we will talk about that in a little while and they do seem like very complex tapestries of elements that you find in other suttas and but 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 which are transported and used slightly different in a different sort of in the collection so there is a lot of cross referencing if you like or of little elements picked up and placed in different sutras in different ways so it's like a very rich embroidery
In fact, the word does appear to be related rather to the word for hearing something um, heard or, or spoken well. And, but I think it's quite nice to think of the thread aspect because once you start reading these suttas, you recognize certain phrases and formulae that you've met elsewhere, but they're used in a slightly different way in, in the sutta concerned. <laughs> 